Welcome back to The Move, or vibing through the book 10 minutes at a time. I'm your host, Justin Koo, and today's episode, we're talking about that time that Jacob and Pharaoh gone on a speed date. If you're wondering, we're looking at Genesis chapter 47, verses 1 through 12. Has anybody called you out for <laughs> being a liar, man? Uh, some people have taken a, a little bit of an uh, objection, maybe a moderate amount of offense with the titles and the thumbnails on occasion. <laughs> no, not the thumbnail. I was going to say oh. the 10 minutes at a time. Oh. Bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one, they definitely, they definitely uh, are, are, are on my back about that one. But we'll, we'll figure it out. In the next season, I think we're probably going to retool the whole thing and just we've talked a little bit about what we're going to be doing next. Yeah, season. vibing with the book. Some amount of time longer yeah. than 10 minutes. <laughs> yes. 10 minutes at a time. Um, I've told you the story about how Emily and I actually met. Tinder. Oh, yeah. Not Tinder. Tinder uh, is kind of like the exact opposite of how we met, Pastor uh -huh. Jonathan. But we met at church, I'll have you know, at an evangelistic series that I was preaching. <laughs> and uh, the reason why this story comes to my mind is actually because of like literally one question that's in this passage. Uh -huh. And it reminds me because... The way that Emily tells me her side of the story was that she saw me on stage. She thought the things that she would think about a guy who's on stage and whatever the case is, but she wasn't willing to like take it further because she's like, this guy looks young, but he's Asian. He's probably like 35 years old and has like four kids already like that or something along those lines. And so even though uh, at the end of the evangelistic series, you know, she shook my hand or the cases like that was the last that I heard of her yeah. until a couple months later, yeah. we actually met at a speed dating event at a church, by the way, a speed dating church event. A speed dating church event. All right. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, she saw me from like across the room and she's like, oh, there's a dude. Clearly he's single if he's here at this event, or hopefully he's single if he's here at the event. He didn't leave the four kids and his four wife. Four little Asian <laughs> kids running around. So uh, she ended up navigating herself so that she was sitting across from me. Which is really surprising because Emily's, you know, from what I know of Emily, she's not the sort. So she, She's a little bit more of a, a reserved kind of individual. So she must have saw something that caught her eye. It, it must have been. Uh, so the question here is, how does this connect to the story? The, the question is that, that Pharaoh seems to be astonished maybe by, by, by Jacob when he when he meets him because he's like yo how old are you <laughs> <laughs> so this is the tangential connection to speed dating yeah, absolutely <laughs> that's how we got here to this text <laughs> these clickbaity titles man so um yeah that, that's an interesting thing about him being 130 years old right because he ends up saying that his days were short and that they were evil hmm. and as opposed to and John Sale Hammer Hammer John Sale Hammer you know my cheat sheet book um and his uh, in his book, The Pentateuch as Narrative, he points out that Jacob's life contrasts to that of his grandfather, Abraham, because Abraham's days were actually long. And yeah, he was like, were, what, how many years old? Uh, no multiple idea. hundreds, right? Like well, 600, 800, something. Uh, I don't know. No, Abraham. No, Abraham was less than 200, right? Oh, OK. okay. Was it? Because it's post flood. All after the flood, everything just got like, yeah, dramatically yeah, shorter. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You see this. Uh, you see this. What well, one? One guy called it this genetic entropy. Like, yeah, completely right. Oh, uh, so yeah, Jacob ends up saying, "Oh, my days were short. They were evil." And Selhammer points out that this is looking forward to the commandment, what the fifth commandment yeah. of honor your father and your mother, that Jacob did not honor his father and his mother. So his days were short hmm. and they were actually outside of the land. Hmm. And, and so you have this uh, sort of contrast that's um, looking forward to this commandment, but at the same time, looking back to Abraham. Hmm. And so Jacob is this linchpin, but Joseph also serves as this linchpin, this kind of hinge point where Joseph ends up being the blessing, the, the gateway by which Jacob can actually bless Pharaoh, which is part of the uh, blessing that Abraham was stewarding, that he was going to be a blessing to others. Yeah. But it's really interesting that that blessing comes by way of Joseph's ministry. Well, well, this is just interesting because if you read the text, like if you didn't read the header of this chapter, I, I think for me, the takeaway is like, dude, like Jacob and the family, Joseph and all, they made it out like real good. Like they yeah, got yeah, the best yeah. land, they yeah, get promotions yeah. and all the good jobs as long as he got the skills. Like Pharaoh is like really like doing it up. Like he's he's taking care of these people. But the way that the chapter, the, the biblical narrative is seeming to be shared, the title is Jacob blesses Pharaoh, not yep. Jacob gets blessed by yeah, Pharaoh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Jacob is actually the one who's stewarding the promise. And the way that the promise actually finds its way to Pharaoh is actually by his son, Joseph, who is this intercessor, this intermediary, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, already you have these strong illusions and th this theme of the blessing of the father comes by way through the son. Mm 
Mm. Right. And so the pagan nations are actually blessed from the father through the son. Mm. And so you see a harbinger of things that are to come in the New Testament, how the nations will actually be blessed by the seed of Abraham, Mm. which is Christ himself. And that blessing is from the father through the son to the nations right in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's just a, a. a really cool portrait already drawing little seeds of what this sort of picture is actually pointing to, right? Because think about it. You have these 12 patriarchs, you have this father, you have this son, you have this, um, you have this pagan uh, power, right? Mm -hmm. That will end up being blessed. And that image, although it's fine, finds its fulfillment in Christ, Mm -hmm. Right. Like, watch the inversion of it. What is the power that ought to first receive the blessing to go to the nations? The first governmental, like nation state, if you can use that, that's an- anachronistic, but whatever. The first country, the first people group that's supposed to actually receive from the father through the son to actually be a blessing. Israel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And. And they, they reject it. They reject it, right? Interesting. Same way that Joseph is rejected by his kin. Exactly. Huh. But now the blessing goes from Joseph to the but, pagans, but Joseph is a blessing for his kin. Interesting. Because in him actually resurrecting, they still have standing. So some of the right? first people to receive the truth of the gospel are, are Gentiles. And even in that moment, the brothers are still somehow corralled into that blessing as well. Yeah, well, they're the root. I mean, sure. right? But, I mean, is, in the sense that they initially rejected, but still, like, there's still redemption. Yeah, yeah. And then this is where you get to things like Romans 9 through 11, where Paul's like, oh, that I wish that my people, you know, the people of Israel. And a lot of times you have this idea where the the branch of Israel, right, that comes from the root, that they're like somehow snapped off and then right. the Gentiles are grafted in. But that's not really the Greek language there. The Greek language is that somehow that the root actually has like a splice or a tear or a break, Hmm. right? It's not completely clean off. It just has some sort of a fissure and the Gentiles are grafted into that fissure there. Mm. And so that then both of them can grow strong, right? Oh, okay. So, but they're there because of that split. The Gentiles are there because of that split. So right here, you already see the first seeds of how the gospel is going to go forward through the intercession of the son to the pagans, while at the same time, the patriarchs still have a blessing because of the faithfulness of the son. Wow. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'm curious uh, for, from like maybe Pharaoh's perspective, and I don't know if there's any insight to this, but like, what's the, what's the reason why he's rolling out the red carpet to this like extent? Is this just another one of the cool ways that God is working to provide for his people? Is there some other additional motivation behind this? Well, I, it, from the surface reading, I think what you see is that Joseph has been such an incredible blessing mm. that Pharaoh actually sees that to actually have this man that the spirit of God is on and then to have his 12 brothers and his family is only going to be good for Egypt. Mm. You've had 14 years of evidence yeah. that this guy's presence has actually been life giving. And here you have a pagan recognizing that what these people steward and what they've been given is actually life giving. And it is of a benefit to us to actually have them. And Pharaoh's the first one, like whatever's my stuff, you take care of it because whatever y'all touch is a blessing. Yeah. Right. And as much as, in so much as they steward that blessing, they are actually a blessing to others. This is a fulfillment of the promise of Abraham. You will be a blessing to others. Not only will you be a blessing to others, but others will recognize that you are a blessing. Again, this is a harbinger or this is a a call back to Abraham Mm -hmm. where Pharaoh sees Abraham like, yo, the favor of God is upon you. Mm -hmm. Those who interact with Abraham and his journeys, yo, the favor of God is upon you. And they align themselves with the favor of God. And in doing so, Abraham is actually fulfilling the Eden commandment of bringing righteousness out into the world Mm -hmm. and overtaking the world in righteousness. Why? Because through him flows the blessing of God to others so that the blessing actually brings life, right? And Mm -hmm. Pharaoh recognizes this. They're like, yeah, Come on, y'all be on my team too. I want to be down with y'all. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, absolutely. I, now I'm thinking like, what would this look like if if it was mirrored to today? Because because I'm curious if that's how like those outside of the body feel about when we interact with them. If that's how they feel. Like, oh man, y'all are a blessing. Like, we want you on our team. Like, we want you to come dwell in our land. Yeah, I mean, 
in small cases, I think sure. that's true, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, as we sit here and we think about um, the sort of labels that Christianity would probably carry if uh, those who aren't Christian were allowed to label us, which, I mean, they 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 categorize Christians. If you're, you're to say, what, what does a Christian represent? I mean, there has been uh, surveys on this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish we had pulled some up, but usually Christians are not seen as life-giving, right? Yeah. They're seen as judgmental. They're seen as narrow. They're seen as right-wing conservatives that not just because they want to uh, conserve some sort of um, ideals about humanity and its relationship to God, mm. but the right wing sort of crazy, at least that's what the outside sees, sure. right? whether right or wrong. And so I think that we can learn something about uh, the way Joseph stewards his life in front of a pagan, the way Jacob actually blesses the pagan, the way Titus uh. Uh, tells us to obey the uh, rulers, rulers, yeah. right? The yeah. same thing with Romans chapter 12. And that as Christians, we're supposed to be a blessing in and right. amongst, uh, you know, the pagan world. But, you know, there's, America has a complex history with that. Mm -hmm. And so does evangelicalism and, you know, American Christianity. But yeah. Not try to get too far down that rabbit hole. <laughs> but yeah, you know, there's there's this declaration in scripture that those who steward the promise are gonna be a blessing. And mm. have we dropped the ball in American Christianity in 2022? Uh it's certainly it's certainly just like <laughs> right now, right? I think it's so interesting the way that this this chapter is described by whoever chose to label the chapter, yeah, yeah. right? Because you read the chapter, it's like they're, they're getting all the good stuff, but it's actually Jacob blesses Pharaoh, yeah. and I think that's such a, it, it is true that they receive blessing, like they're yeah. saved in this way from the famine. They're they're able to get food, they get this nice land, but the focus is on the way that they are a blessing to the world. And let it be known that this was Jacob's destiny. Like mm -hmm. Jacob was always destined to steward the blessing. Like this is what was prophesied about his life. He, you know, he intervened and made it harder than he should have made it. Yeah. But yeah. the workings of God still manifest. And this is what Paul is so like dazzled by. He's mm -hmm. like, man, look how God works these things out. Mm -hmm. Right. The majesty and the power of his thinking, like who can actually, like who's equal to him in this way yeah. so that, those who steward the promise are a blessing. They're going to be a blessing one way or another. Mm -hmm. You know, God will see to it. I mean, you know, we as believers can then decide whether we're going to be like Jacob, who takes it upon himself and just makes a mess of things in a way that he didn't have to, or are we just going to let this blessing flow, right? And sometimes um, we don't know that the blessing can flow because we don't believe that every single blessing is ours, right? Yeah. That's another thing, right? Blessed be the God and Father who of uh, Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. And so there's many lessons for us as Christians in this story about letting the blessing flow. There's many lessons about how Jesus intercedes on our behalf as the son who mediates this stuff. There's lessons about being out there and actually, um, you know, letting our light shine for the pagans. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lessons about not being like Jacob and having our days be short and evil because we're not honoring our parents. Um, yeah, so all of these lessons are instructive to us so that we could have our minds shaped to live according to the gospel truth. And I think that's why these stories are so powerful because you can mind them at these deep, deep levels. And we haven't even touched the surface, right? Like there's so many play on words that give us windows into the idea that God is trying to present. And maybe one day we should do that. I got a buddy of mine who does these deep exegetical studies Ooh. and maybe we could take a passage and just show how deep even the textual play on words go in order to illuminate our minds. But these are some of the ideas that emerge. I think we have enough nerdy people following the move that would find that exciting. All right. Well, then we'll do it. <laughs>